So, yeah, I work at LASP. That's Laboratory for Atmospheric Space Physics in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, yeah, my subtitle also could have been Planetary Remote Sensing. There are so many words for it, but basically, um, so here's, here's what I did uh, and uh, what I do now. I got a PhD in astrophysics uh, in a certain sub-branch with a very long name. Uh, and then I changed to the local solar system for various reasons. Uh, and since then, I've worked on several satellite missions. So there's the Dawn mission to the asteroid belt, which is currently at uh, Ceres. I worked on the camera subsystem that was built in Germany. And by the way, if anybody of you does not do satellite missions but have watched Star Trek, ion engines are real. The, so this satellite mission actually uses an ion engine to go from body to body. And because it's so saving, saving so much fuel, it's actually able to do basically twice the mission um, over the lifetime of itself. Uh, I worked then for four years in Bern on the future mission, Bepi Colombo mission uh, to Mercury on a laser altimeter. It's not yet launching, but then I went on for a postdoc at UCLA, uh, worked there on the recalibration of the Divina radiometer data set, and now I'm working on Cassini image and ultraviolet data analysis and the MAVEN ultraviolet instrument calibration. So basically I'm really hopping from mission to mission. Uh, I find space missions just really cool. This is the next best thing if you have no possibility to become an astronaut to actually be in space. Um, I do a little bit of science when I have, whenever I have time on it and I actually got now finally my own funding to do a bit of more on that. That's basically CO2 jets on Mars which actually I have to take out because I don't have much time. But yeah, come, come to me and chat about it. I'm using a Python since 2004, version 2.2. .2. I remember it. I think I was, uh, yeah, I was a grad student and I was very uh, excited about the 2.3 upgrade because there were some functionalities coming in. I don't remember what it was, but I remember distinct, distinctively this change. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you actually this. This is brand new from the press. Uh, maybe you have seen those photos around, those bright spots on Ceres. The newest thing that came out on press yesterday or today, apparently it's not water ice, it's salt. You heard, heard it here first. So uh, it's uh, highly reflective salts. Uh, uh, apparently the spectrometer data does not support the idea that it's ice. So got it for me. <laughs> Uh, all right, I want to discuss uh, three tool areas. Also, uh, sorry, I forgot an update there. Uh, Cassini ISS, data retrieval and processing, and LRO diviner. Just I uh, want to show a little trick I did with uh, labeling uh, different objects in my data. And, uh, and then I want to talk about a new library which we want to create for planetary tools. Um, but yeah, more, more on that later. So uh, this is just a little convenience library. It's not much technical code. Um, um, it's just really helping me to be a bit more productive. The satellite um, problematic is always in a way that you have a lot of data sources. You want to get a lot of data from different uh, sources um, that you have to match. And then you have metadata to manage the satellites don't behave or they get different radiation. They have different temperature over the satellite body. And you have to manage all that. And so it's like a lot of chaos, a lot of little steps until you finally can do some calculations. So um, a lot of my tools are really simple convenience uh, utilities that uh, I gathered over the years. And uh, I felt that it's finally time to come out of the shadows and put it somewhere on a place and where we can discuss what kind of stuff is maybe unifiable in a, in a, for space missions so that we can put it all together. Uh, so the use case one downloading here, you read maybe about this funny name, uh, uh, image name that uh, is a, a Cassini imaging subsystem and uh, you want to get it. So there is uh, on this website here, uh, there is a tool uh, with a database interface to get it, but you have to learn it. So I thought uh, why not put it into some easier interface. Uh, so I don't need to learn how to use this. So. The Opus website uh, for this data downloading offers this URL request-based JSON I API. I was wondering, does that sound right? Because I have no idea what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> but I've wrapped it. So. <laughs> so 
uh, all these search criteria that are av uh, available there, that you can be accessed with this JSON text strings, and I read it all up, and they have a not too bad uh, uh, documentation on the website, and uh, they're also very keen on if you find bugs, uh, uh, you send them to them, they usually fix it in a day, so it's really, really nice. So I've read so far only what, what I needed, so I do, uh, I, I create myself an API object, I put this file name which I found in the paper in there, and then it finds exactly only one observation ID, which is good, so there's no overlap. Sometimes maybe subsystems have the same naming scheme, then you have to be careful how to do it better. What you get here is a raw and calibrated images, and each of them have a label and an image, and there you can see the download string. You can either now do it on your own, but I also put some downloading feature in. I'm using the request module, which is very convenient and Pythonic uh, to, to get things from the web. And see, it's very simple. You could do it yourself, but yeah, now I started it and maybe somebody finds it interesting and we could join uh, on the use case and make it better and maybe there are other download uh, web bases where we could do the same stuff. Um, that's some other of the sub-functions I have in there as well, download previews, uh, get between resolutions is something where I want to filter for certain ring resolutions in the Saturnian rings. And uh, this is basically the image that comes, comes down. That's, uh, I, I have a parameter here for the what, how big the preview should be. This is only a preview. Uh, that's an image of Titan, by the way. And, uh, and then I can also download it. And uh, yeah, there are some controls available where, where it should be, obviously, path management and so on. Uh, oh yeah, and this is the get between resolutions. That's how, how much uh, pixel, uh, how many pixel per kilometer in the projected ring plane. So after projection would be, and then it finds 69s. All right, the use case two for this, uh, for the uh, Cassini image reader is the calibration pipeline. This uh, heavily uh, is based on ISIS. Uh, somebody, uh, I was asking the good question before, is there any unification possible in astronomy and in, in space missions, and it's, it's very true because of the technology advancement, advancements, uh, the interfaces are also on the engineering level have changed all the time, and I think that's one of the reasons why unification was so hard to do, and everybody went their own way. And yeah, and you always want to get the best but safest technology to use for a space mission because it's so expensive and you don't want to risk anything. And because of also this risk management, I think the uh, powers that be often demand that you don't reuse other tools, but do everything in-house and so on. So there's a lot of politics involved as well with this question of unification. So I, uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, very often I use ISIS. This is uh, an integrated software for images and spectrometers that's developed by USGS. It's C++ based, but some very nice p people have developed a Python interface, which is just a uh, operating system call uh, to execute this. So you have to install on your own the ISIS subsystem and then it will be called, but it's very convenient. I have a few lines here. So um, I guess, uh, can I, oh yeah. So I have here, that's the standard pipeline for Cassini image. Is, oh, by the way, motiva motivation for this, you might have seen before that there was a calibrated image to download. But uh, the thing, like uh, what happens is, uh, work teams only have so much capacity to upload uh, a new version of a calibration. So sometimes there exists new calibration code, but it is not in the archives. And therefore, you have a motivation sometimes to redo the calibration on your own with this uh, pipeline of uh, ISIS commands uh, just to get the best calibration possible. So here, this is an import into the ISIS system, uh, KISS to ISIS, then um, here is the important, I need to tweak something because I'm only interested in rings in this case. Uh, Spice in it. How many people in the room know Spice, the navigation tool for inter solar system geometries? One, two. Oh, yeah, okay, there are some. Oh, hi, Stuart. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, uh, basically very important to know where you are in the solar system where, and where you're looking at. And that in, in full in its full glory in 3D. And just imagine how many angles of vision are possible. And uh, for example, the Mars rovers, they have, a diff they have like six coordinate system, one where the rover is, 
where, where the arm is, where the arm is currently pointing, where the instrument is pointing. And these are like a multiple chain of coordinate conversions. And the ISIS, sorry, the SPICE tool set is helping you with that. Okay. Oops. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this is uh, an image uh, that I have uh, downloaded, projected with that uh, uh, chain and also filtered uh, as uh, Howard already was displaying. Uh, the first things of data you get is, is never really clean. Uh, in the beginning of the mission also you have to fight with maybe some idiosyncrasies of the detector that you uh, did not expect before. So the calibration gets better over time. That's, as I said, that's why it's maybe worth to redo it. And uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to show this because if you are mathematically inclined, the Saturnian rings are just beautiful because it is showing you math in reality. All, all these are uh, complicated oscillation modes and resonance modes between the different moons. They create all this structure and we, we at, at last, uh, uh, with my boss Larry Esposito, we're still working on, on understanding how these structures change over time, how there are subwaves inside the rings and so on. But it's really, uh, if, you, if you like how math is exemplified in nature, the rings are a beautiful example of it. Okay, then I have to uh, change to the next one. Right, so diviner radiometer, that's my LRO uh, stuff. Uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter is a satellite that still flies around the, Earth, uh, the, the moon. It takes data constantly, as at least in our instrument case, we are a radiometer with low resolution, so the data uh, amount is not that gigantic uh, in principle, but it's like trickling all over the mission time. So we have uh, collected a lot of data now. We're mapping the surface temperature of, of the moon uh, in, in eight or uh, nine wavelength bands, and each wavelength band has 21 detectors. So the resolution is not very high, but the important thing what we want to do is that we understand the temp how the surface temperature of the moon changes, and because of that, if you have that in high detail over all local times of the moon, then you can basically re-infer what kind of material is lying on the surface, so without being there. So it's like a genius uh, back calculation like remote geology, basically. So uh, we have like something like two terabyte raw data, uh, but if you create all the map projects out of it, like uh, uh, this one, and, and if you do that for all wavelengths channels and so on, so then at the end we end up with 150 terabyte. So because I, w I had a, as a postdoc job uh, to recalibrate the whole data set together with somebody else who was doing the mapping project, for playing around with different versions, we got a petabyte disk to play with, so that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that was my task. There was a previous implementation of the whole calibration pipeline, but it was basically outsourced professional development by a C++ programmer. It was fast, but was unflexible, very similar to what Howard said before. Um, so, and it was hard to grok for me. It was like all time event based, so and then you had to dig through the whole code, what happens for, for, for treating this event. So I had an open hand on how to do it, so I did it with Python with a lot of pandas. So this is example of the raw data. Um, oh yeah, I have a pointer here. So these are calibration points where the, uh, the telescope points not on the moon, but points to space to get a zero level and then to an internal heat source that is measured with a temperature sensor so that we have a comparison. So, uh, and because the temperature of the sensor and the environment and the satellite changes over time, this is very sensitive with these kind of sensors, these thermal pile sensors. So we have to recalibrate every 10 minutes. And there are different methods to do and there are uh, newer ideas and that was the idea why we wanted to recalibrate the whole thing. I, I zoom into this box here in the center. Uh, so this is here, this is normal data. Then I move the telescope, I look to the space, I look to the internal calibration source, I look to space, and then again on, on the ground. And uh, as you can see, this is all, uh, it's a bit small here, but here, this is all pandas. And I'm really, uh, for me, it was a heaven sent tool that I could uh, make a time index and then relate it to the different columns. All my columns are just the channels and the detectors of my data set. 
So, and they're all indexed, and they're exactly taken at the same time, which just makes it easier. It can be harder, of course, if there are time shifts with that. But it was that was really nice that uh, uh, with pandas I could relate and filter on it, and that that's the trick I wanted to show you now. So. Uh, this is in one hour, the different uh, um, roughly 10 minutes, uh, every 10 minutes I have a block, so in this case it just fit that 10 calibration blocks fit inside, and there's different, slightly different observations. So I needed to find a way how to address and quickly get a calibration block. And uh, obviously the telescope moves, I have the data on, on which angles the telescope moves, but um, because here, there's different things happening. I need to be able to say, give me calibration block four in the set because I need to treat it differently. So uh, a pure telescope uh, angle pointing was not enough. So I had to come up with a way how to label these things. And I, uh, for a long time I was uh, stuck with that and how to do that. And, and I was like saying the word label in my head until I realized what I learned in image processing. There's a labeling routine. And I realized that the labeling routine for images also works in 1D. So what, what I did is first I, I assigned to the data uh, via the angles, um, I create a filter that, that, that uh, is basically the row filter for pandas. And then uh, with that row filter I assign numbers of, of being uh, like a status, what kind of science data is that? And then I apply basically the ND labeling routine which people know from, uh, from SciPy. And for calibration block labels, not not caring what they are, I just say that it could be one, two, or three, meaning a space view, SV, a black body view, or a, a solar target view. And then after that, uh, I just create very convenient uh, binary uh, strings so that I can access the data like that. And uh, really this labeling uh, really helped me to create basically interface numbers for all these calibration blocks. So within one hour block I have six, and then I find out which one is different one and give me just calibration block four. So. This is what I did with that. And I promised uh, Min uh, uh, the, to show the simplest IPython parallel use for my case. Uh, so if you are scared of parallel processing, I was for a long time, I still am actually. I just want to uh, give you hopes that with this IPython parallel use case, uh, uh, give an e easy example, the easiest example where in my point of view, where you really don't care where something is running and uh, you just want s the same thing happening over many files. And many files, everybody of us has many files at some point that are independent of each other. So it's the most embarrassingly parallel processing imaginable. So I just have a folder, a folder name. I want to do something in that folder, in this case with the Python tool, Pisces tools. I want to uh, calibrate them, so I just filter them. I use pandas for filtering because it's so nice getting the string content of a path, so I can do a lot of that. But uh, so, yeah, so that's a bit, so I wanted to show you uh, here. So this is just the one, this one line. So it's a bit chaotic, unfortunately. I had it, uh, had it looking better in, in the previous view of my uh, version of the slide, but uh, th these are all available, uh, so it's really only, uh, ah, by the way, and this is a vi widget progress line, uh, a pr progress bar, which is very nice to use uh, just for this processing. And I'll leave you, uh, just because I'm running out of time, I'll leave you with the with the last slide, uh, sorry, with the last, if that still pops up, where's my next slide? Okay, so uh, just with uh, some, we have to talk with Eric about all these uh, experiences for doing that because we basically just created a planetary Pi set and that, by the way, Austin Gottberg created this on GitHub site for us and he will talk about what he already put in there. I will add my stuff later on that. And uh, yeah, so we are not even a toddler yet. It's just a couple of weeks old, but we will basically want to try to unify things. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.